If you would, turn in your Bibles this morning again to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians Ephesians, uh, chapter 5 this morning. And we'll begin reading with verse 18 uh, for context there and begin and then read down through verse 21 uh, this morning. Uh, And so if you would please stand in honor of God's word. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father, and being subject to one another in the fear of Christ. May God bless his holy word. You may be seated. We're continuing on with this particular section of scriptures. We've talked about through this, uh, that this in chapters 4 and 5 and 6 are really the practical portion of of the book of Ephesians. As we know, the first three chapters, as we've said before, is the foundational, the apostles' doctrine. Uh, This is what the church is built upon, the apostles' doctrine, which in essence is the doctrine that the apostles received from Christ. It didn't originate with them, it originated with Christ. And I believe that very much that not only did he teach them during the time when he was here in that his sojourn on the earth for those three years... Uh, but I believe that after his resurrection and he was here on the earth for 40 days that there was teaching going on there too. There was a very much uh, the school of the apostles that the Lord Jesus Christ taught. And during the, that time, he gave them this foundation. And then, of course, the apostle Paul was, of course, converted upon the road to Damascus. And then we know that for three years, he went to Saudi Arabia. And there, I believe, he had private teaching and learning, as he said there. But as we look at this, and we've we looked at the, the doctrinal foundation, and now we're looking at the practical part, there, there is, what Paul is saying is, is the apostles' doctrine is not just about what you learn in the mind and the truths that you hold on to. I mean, those certainly are the foundation. They're the foundation for our practice, and we're going to talk about that, as the foundation for our music, uh, this morning that we sing is the doctrine of the scriptures, the doctrine of the word of God this morning. But as we, as we talked about this, about the, the church, and we talked about that some in chapter 4, and then we began to get into, as I said in verse 17, about putting on the new man and putting off the new man. And then chapter 5, he said, be imitators of God as beloved children, and told, told us how to walk and what we are not to be anymore. And he said, don't be sexually immoral, don't be drunkards, don't be liars, uh, watch your tongue, <laughs> watch your mouth, so to speak. All of these things that the the doctrine that we love and know, that we come to know as believers, is transformative. Uh, it is to change us. And the world is to see that change. The world needs to see that change. Uh, if we are like a bunch of Pharisees and we say, well, we believe this doctrine, but we don't put any of it to practice, then we'll just be called a bunch of hypocrites. And sometimes the shoe fits, but... We're not to wear the shoes of the Pharisees. We are to wear the shoes of the people of Christ and to be obedient to the word of God and to be transformed, to be renewed in our minds. And so we've come down to this section, and if you look here about the practical things here that he talks about there in chapter 4 and chapter 5, and then as we talked about there, he said, don't get drunk with wine, that is, dissipation, or really I think a better translation is debauchery, sinful behavior, but be filled with the Spirit. How do we get to be filled with the Spirit? And we talked about this, but in my own thinking here, I think, you know, we believe that the re- one of the reasons we teach verse upon verse is because everything's always in context. And the context of the being filled with the Spirit is the fact that you get there by putting off the old man and putting on the new. 
the more that we become practically sanctified, the more vessels that we become for being filled with the Spirit. And I talked about this, about the importance of the confession of sin regularly as believers. Do not think as believers that we don't commit sin. We know that we are still in this old man. We need to confess sin. John said, if any man says he's without sin, he's a liar. But if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us and put us back into fellowship with Christ. And you're not going to be somebody that is filled with the Spirit and not be regularly confessing your sins and striving for putting on the new man. So if you want to be filled with the Spirit, then you confess your sins and you strive to put on the new man. But then he gets into some things here about, you know, as he talks about here, he's talking about what, how do we express this filling with the Spirit. And we talked about this it, the evidence, one of the evidences of it is the overflowing love and joy of believers. The Holy Spirit, as we talked about, the first two things listed in the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy. And I believe this, that if you are filled with the Spirit, you're going to love God first. That's going to be evident. And then you're going to love your brothers and sisters in Christ. And then you're going to be filled with joy. With joy. And I believe joy has an outward expression. Do you not? I hope so. And as I've said, sometimes I'm not sure in some of our more conservative Christian circles that we really believe that because we're afraid that somebody's going to think something about us if we express joy. My goodness, if I raise a hand, somebody's going to think I'm weird. Somebody's going to think, if I say amen, somebody's going to think, what is wrong with that person? But there are to be expressions of joy. And so the Apostle Paul gets into that in these verses right here. Particularly here in verse 19. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord. Now there's really a companion verse with that. If you go to the book of Colossians, a lot of the same things that Paul talks about in Ephesians, he talks about in Colossians. And in Colossians 3.16, he says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with gratefulness in your hearts to God. It's much like what we see in this section of Scripture right here. So what Paul is saying here is that yes, We are to worship God with our voices. That's what God has given us these voices for when we come to God's house. To come together and sing. To lift our voices in song to God. Out of this joy and praise. But also, I think when he's talking about here speaking to one another. And then if you look at Colossians 3.16. He's talking about here it is to teach us and encourage the people of God. We learn about God. We learn doctrine. We learn theology from our music. Do we not? From our songs, the songs that we sing. So I believe congregational singing is very biblical. We are learning and teaching doctrine actually to one another. When we're singing, he's saying this. You are speaking to one another and you are teaching one another doctrine. When Brother Mark's up here leading music and we're singing and he's singing and we're all singing together, we're teaching one another the doctrine of the Word of God. And so this is what we're looking at. And so it's a biblical thing to come and to sing. And it's theology set to music, expressing our joy to the Lord out of hearts of joy and being a spirit-filled believer, I hope. And a number, we we look at this, and and if you look at the Psalms, he talks here, and I'm not going to, I'll get here in a minute to the differences here in the type of the Psalms and the hymns and the spiritual songs. But if you look at the Psalms and you look at hymns and you look at the, the spiritual songs, now the Psalms, much of the Psalms are rooted in what? The law he talks about over, in fact, I I looked this up in Strong's Concordance and I couldn't count it all probably, but 
the, to, where he talks about the law and the word and the precepts of God and the testimonies of God, it's used somewhere between 100 and 200 times that he talks about that. So the biblicality of the music uh, in the Psalms in the Old Testament is just inherent in that. Those that wrote the Psalms, and they're not all written by David, by the way. Everybody thinks all the Psalms are written by David. No, they're not. Asaph wrote some. Uh, there were some Levitical priests. If you look at Psalm 73 through 83 and Psalm 88 and 89, they're written by Levitical priests. But there are people that had a deep knowledge of God's word. A deep knowledge of God's word. And I'll, I'll be just, let me, I've, I've got to make a comment about this. There's a lot of people out there writing quote unquote Christian music today. They shouldn't be writing music. <laughs> they shouldn't be writing music. They should just, they'd be better off leaving it alone. Uh, but it's rooted in God's word. It's rooted in the, in the knowledge. And, and if you'll find many of the older hymns were written by, guess what? Not musicians. Pastors. Theologians wrote the hymns that we know, many of the ones that we write. Why? And they're very biblical. There's a reason why they're very biblical, because these guys had a deep understanding of the Word of God and a knowledge of God, and so they wanted that to be transmitted in the congregational singing of the churches. It needs to be. This is where it comes. And let's be honest, there's a lot of things about music that it just sort of ingrains into our brain that we really don't know it. It's sort of like, you know, okay, I was a child of the 70s, you know. And uh, confession time, we didn't have much Christian music back then. Guess what kind of music I listened to? It's in, I won't tell you who I listened to. <laughs> but it's ingrained in my brain. And immediately when a song comes on the radio, sometimes, and yes, sometimes I do still listen to some of that I'm more choosy than I used to be because I pay attention to the, the lyrics now. I can't say that I paid attention to the lyrics back then as much as I should have, but I hear the tune and I immediately know what the song is and who the artist is. And so these songs that we teach to our children, we should be teaching these songs to our children, should we not? Because when we teach these songs to our children, parents, we are ingraining theology into their brain. Theology that they will what? Remember for the rest of their lives. They will. When we're doing that, and we should. If you're not, you should be. We should be doing that. But so what we see here, what Paul is talking here about is is the overflow of the filling of the Holy Spirit is expressed when believers gather together in God's house and songs that express truth about God and teach the people of God and admonish one another. This is what we're doing and we're teaching these things. And Now let me say this. It's also something else that this verse teaches. Is that there is to be variety. There are to be different kinds of songs that we sing. Uh, that they're not all of the same. They shouldn't, I mean, psalms are great, but they shouldn't all be psalms. Hymns are great, but they shouldn't all be hymns. And spiritual songs are great, but they shouldn't all be that. And they shouldn't all be praise choruses either that you sing 15 or 20 times in a row. Okay? And hymnals should have, I believe, and I, I mean, I'm an old-fashioned guy. Now, one of these days when I'm dead and gone, if you want to put some screens up in here, then, you know, okay. I won't have anything to say about it, but I hope not. <laughs> uh, but, you know, but I love these new hymnals that we have because it has a variety of music in it. Except not many psalms, and we're going to talk about that in a minute here. But, but you know, we, we sing songs. We have this variety of songs. But it's in, these songs are to be instructing, instructive in telling us uh, about our Lord. And the, this is the expression when we come in here on Sunday mornings. It's the expression of our joy in Christ and our love for Christ and what he has done for us in all of these types of songs. 
And so there should be one central theme in all of them. Should it not? The central theme, it's theme is Christ. His and, and God's honor and God's glory and God's salvation and those type of things. You know, it should be pointing men to Christ. It shouldn't be about my felt needs or my emotions. And, and again, I think that that's part of the problem that we have in this day. Now, there have been different denominations or groups in the history of Christendom that I have, I think, had too much emphasis upon just one category or types of songs. I'll just be blatantly honest here. My favorite hymn writer of all time is Isaac Watts. Love Isaac Watts. And he had more depth to his songs, and, and more of his songs are included in, in, in Orthodox hymnals, I think, than anybody else even though he wrote less than maybe like Charles Wesley, you know, but Watts' theology was better. <laughs> but, you know, when he, he was a Puritan, and so he, when he was younger, he would go to the churches, and all they were singing was the Psalms, and, he, and he, I remember reading his biography, and he said, you know, we need, he says, we need to have some different kind of music. So guess what? When he got old enough, guess what he started doing? He started writing these poems, and then they set them to music, and this is where we get some of the great hymns that we sing in our church in here many times. You know, we need to have that variety. And he so he and then he encouraged setting the psalms to more modern language and music to make them more singable. And we have that, and I'm glad there's guys that do that. You know, guys like the Gettys and guys like Stuart Townsend and some other guys that will set some of these to a little bit more modern uh, tunes, and and a whole new generation is born out that loves the psalms and loves some of the old hymns in this. I don't think that Isaac would turn over in his grave by us doing that. But whatever songs are sung in the church, we first of all need to make sure that the lyrics are biblical. Biblical, that is the most important thing. Are the words that we are singing biblical? We should not expect one thing out of the pulpit and something else out of the songs. <laughs> If we're going to preach truth and we have such an emphasis upon truth in our church, we need to be singing it too. We need to be singing truth in that. Now, up until the latter part of the 19th century, and this is a little history lesson here, forgive me, I'm a history buff, I'm going to tell you this, okay? But up until the latter part of the 19th century, hymns dominated really the songs of the church from the Reformation time on. But then we had the revivalism of the later 19th century, Charles Finney and D.L. Moody. And so there came an emphasis on what is known as gospel songs, which were short and simpler tunes, which while some were and still, I would say, are fine or okay, did not really teach a lot of doctrine about God or salvation, or their doctrine was just bad. Uh, there were, as somebody said, there was, they were long on sentimentality and short on teaching. Some of those songs, and I hope I don't offend anybody when I tell you some, what some of the songs are. And I have to admit, when I was younger, I sang a, these a lot, some of these. Love lifted me. It is no secret what God can do. In the garden, take my hand, precious Lord. And while a lot of people really love those songs, there's not a lot of doctrine in there. There's more emotion and sentiment there in that. And so this carried on for most of the 20th century, that this is the kind of music. This is what I kind of remember singing for the most part when I was younger because, you know, I was in the, born in the 50s uh, during that time and so the latter part of that century. But thank God that during the early 21st century, we started having some guys that started writing new hymns, which I'm all in favor of because I believe that God raises up people in every particular age to Christians to write biblical hymns in this. And so we begin to see this, and we sing some of these, sing of new hymns, a standard that we sing very often, in Christ alone. 
He will hold me fast. Love that song. He will hold me fast. The power of the cross. Our sovereign God that we just sang a week or two ago. All glory be to Christ, which I can never finish because I end up in tears every time I sing that song. I can't ever get through the last verse. I don't know if Brother Mark's noticed that yet, but anyway. Can't ever get through that. But it has brought about a resurgence in the interest in old hymns. Amazing grace. There is a fountain, come thou fount, before the throne of God above, which, yes, is an old hymn. Now, I thought it was a newer hymn, but it was written actually back during the 18th, 19th century and then re, has gained resurgence in this age. But it is not about the age of a song. I've run across some people who said, well, I don't trust anything that was written after 1800. <laughs> well, no, because in this, in the last 20, 25 years, we've had people that have written great, great hymns. Great hymns. It's about what the words say. It's about the, what the words are saying to us and what we are teaching one another in singing those songs there. And so this is what, you know, we, we have this emphasis upon teaching the people of God and, 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 and through the songs and noticing, I want you to un understand, I want you to, when you see a song, to say, yes, this is a biblical song or no, this is not a biblical song. There's been sometimes I've been in a church where I was visiting, which has not been very often, and they sang an unbiblical song, and David doesn't sing it because I'm not going to sing an unbiblical song. But let's look briefly at what Paul is, des is describing here regarding what should be sung. Now let me say this, that as, as somebody has said, there's, there's not really precise distinctions here in this type of music. Uh, you know, there are some distinctions, but they're not, they're not really precise. So we need to keep that in mind as we're talking about this because some in the Psalms and then the hymns and the spiritual songs, some of them will have elements of all three in there. Now, regarding the Psalms, that it is likely that what Paul is speaking of is the book of the Psalms written that we have in our Bibles here, mostly by David, but as I said, there are others also. And it comes from the word psalmos, P-S-A-L-M-O-S. Now, it's interesting in the understanding of the word, it means actually a touching, and a touching of the harp or other stringed instruments with the finger. And then finally it became known as the song sung with a musical accompaniment. Now, I'm not going to name it, but there we know there's a denomination that doesn't believe that you should use musical instruments. Well, they're going against actually the teaching of the Apostle Paul. Because Paul would have known, being a Pharisee, what that word meant. It meant singing a song with musical accompaniment. Now, there's nothing wrong with singing a song without musical accompaniment, singing it a cappella, but it's certainly not a sin. It is certainly not forbidden to do that. And so this is what it means. So that means it's fine to use musical instruments in the singing of these songs. Uh, and so now we, need to, now we need to be careful. I've seen also some places where, not in our church, I'm not saying anything about our musicians, okay, <laughs> guys, but where musical instruments have overpowered the words of the song and you can't hear the words of the song from the musical instruments. It's meant to accentuate the worship, not overpower is what it's supposed to do, to enhance that. And then there's hymns that we're talking about here. And the word means a, a religious ode. Now, the musicians will know when an ode is just simply means a song. Uh, but it is actually literally means a song of praise to God. That's what a hymn is. It's a song of praise to God. Didn't we, holy, 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 we're just singing a minute ago. That's praise to God. It is a praise to God. And you've heard of Johann Sebastian Bach. He said all music is to be to the glory of God. It's to be to the glory of God. And so... This is why we sing hymns, because we are praising God. We are lifting up the person of God, 
who he is. You notice after the first Lord's Supper in Matthew 26 and 30, it says that after Jesus had done that and after singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And it was likely, they say, Psalm 118. I thought about, you know, but I couldn't find music to that, so we'll save that for later, Brother Mark. We'll do that one. But we need to be singing hymns. First of all, because the scripture says so, but also in singing hymns and celebrating the great works of God in saving and delivering his people. We are learning his attributes, his omniscience, his omnipotence, his faithfulness, his holiness, his sovereignty. And then we're learning about his resurrection and his atonement and his return to this earth. We are learning these things in the singing of these hymns that we sing in this church. Then Paul says we need to be speaking to each other in spiritual songs, teaching each other. And the reason why Paul says here spiritual songs instead of just songs is because the pagans also sang songs to their gods. And so he's making the distinction here, and I'm sure that these Ephesians had done that because these were probably, for the most part, all saved former idolaters that worshiped pagan gods. So they sang pagan songs. And he said, you don't need to be singing those anymore. You need to be speaking, singing spiritual songs. An example of a spiritual song would be in Revelation chapter 5 and verse 9. It says, they sang a new song, saying, worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain and purchased for God with your blood people from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And so it's not really a, a totally different classification of songs, but it is a song about spiritual, of a spiritual note, spiritual theology about the Lord Jesus Christ or God the Father. And then he says, singing and making melody with your heart to God, or to the Lord, excuse me. So in the second part of the verse, Paul mentions singing and making melody in your heart. God, again, as I've said this before, God created us to praise him, to lift up our voice in praise and adoration to him. As of Psalm 150 and verse 6, let everything that has breath praise God. And listen, I don't understand how people that love the Lord can come to God's house and I look out there and they're either not singing or they look like somebody's making them sing, like they're taking castor oil or something like that. We need to be lifting our voices in praise to God, giving praise to Him. This is what we're here for. We should be blowing the roof off this place. That's my thought. And it's a lot easier now than when a couple of years ago we only had about 30 people in here. <laughs> uh, good problem. I'm not saying, yeah, you all need to stay. I don't want anybody going anywhere. But, it, you know, we need to be doing that. And David wrote in Psalm 7 and 17, I will give thanks to Yahweh according to his righteousness and will sing praises to the name of Yahweh most high. Psalm 13 verse 6, I will sing to Yahweh because he has dealt bountifully with me. Psalm 30 and 4, sing praise to Yahweh, you his holy ones. Give thanks for the remembrance of his holy name. Shout for joy in Psalm 49 verse 13, O heavens, and rejoice, O earth, break forth to joyful shouting on mountains for Yahweh has comforted his people and will have compassion on his afflicted. You see, we sing because of who he is. He's holy. He's righteous. Look at what he's done and his compassion for us. Yes, sing. <laughs> sing to him. Lift your voice to him. We are musical creatures. Let's be honest with this. You don't, have to, you don't have to teach kids to dance, okay? We hear some music, and it makes us <laughs> move <laughs> or tap our foot. You know, something along those lines. No, I'm not going to sing. Don't worry about it. <laughs> not a solo. But this phrase, then we have this phrase, making melody. Makes me th it makes me think of some now. I've talked about the old gospel songs, but there's some that were okay. But it makes me think of this one, and, and maybe some of you that are a little few more birthdays have know this. There's within my heart a melody. I knew Paul would know that. 
And then there's joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Amen. All right. But you see, when we are filled with the Spirit of God, there's a joy that's just dying to get out. That's just wanting to burst out in song to God, to our Savior, our Lord, our Master. We just, we just have to get that out of there. The joy, that joy is celebrating and exalting Christ, who He is, what He has done for us, and the salvation that He has bestowed upon us. How can that not come out of your soul? How can that not come out? And so what Paul is saying here is being filled with the Spirit, then you're to be speaking one of the manifestations of that, especially when we gather together, is this singing to God and singing to Christ and giving adoration to Him. Always, he says here, let me move on. Always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father. Not only will, I believe, a spirit-filled believer want to sing and proclaim praise to God, but a spirit-filled believer will give evidence by always giving thanks. We talked about this, touched on it this morning in the prayer meeting, always giving thanks. Is it always easy to give thanks? Is everything that happens to us in this world good? Well, you know the answer to that, at least from our perspective, no. But we are to be in this continuous state of heart of giving thanks. That even when things don't go well, give thanks. When the bank account is low, give thanks. When the car is broken down on the side of the road, give thanks. This is, I mean, very well closely parallels Romans 8 and 28. For we know that all things work together for good. Not just the good things, but all things. God is working in us to conform us to the image of His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what He's doing. This is what's happening here. It means all things. And so it goes along, that, that's what we call, talked about the providence of God, but it also goes along with the filling of the Spirit. And when we are filled with the Spirit, let me say something, it's a whole lot easier to say, Lord, I don't know why this trial or this tribulation is coming into my life, but I'm going to give thanks. And you, now you think about who wrote this, the Apostle Paul. He was not sitting in a hotel when he was writing this. He was a prisoner. It's a prison epistle. But he's saying, I've got chains around my ankles, but give thanks. I've been beaten at least five times with 39 stripes, but give thanks. I've been lost upon the ocean in danger of drowning, but give thanks. And then I have the care of all these churches upon me, weighing me down, but give thanks. He lived what he taught. He lived what he taught. It wasn't just some pie-in-the-sky theology. So this attitude of having a thankful heart and spirit in all things goes along with the joy that causes the melody. If you look at the Psalms, you see that. Psalm 69 and 30. I will praise the name of God with song and what? And magnify him with thanksgiving. Psalm 95 and 2, let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a loud shout to him with songs of praise. I'm going to be, I'm, I'm sure because I've been there. There's some Sundays you come to church and it's been a hard week. And maybe even just the day before has been a hard, hard day. And you get to God's house and you're thinking, I really don't want to sing today. I really don't want to give thanks today. But if we are filled with the Spirit of God as His children, we can still give thanks. And we can still sing the songs of Zion like Paul and Silas did down there in that Philippian jail. We can still do it and should do it and shake our fist in Satan's face and see, stick our tongues out of him. <laughs> Greater is he that is in me than you and he that is in the world. And then Paul enjoined this thankfulness also in 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 and 8 through 18. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. 
Yes, you may be going through a difficult time. Maybe you're going through a time of blessing. Whatever it is, this is God's will for you. It is not a mistake. It is not something for you to gripe about and complain about. When you leave this place and you go to work tomorrow morning, we should still be giving thanks tomorrow and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday. Every single day of the week, our hearts should be pouring out with an abundance of thankfulness. In Colossians chapter 2 and verse 7, having been firmly rooted and being built up in him and having been established in your faith just as you were instructed and abounding with thanksgiving. I mean not just uttering a few, a few little words of thanksgiving, but abounding and it's pouring out of us. Man, isn't God good? Somebody says God is good all the time. You know, it's kind of a good bumper sticker, but how many people really believe that? It's easy to be thankful when everything is fine. You know, it is. It's harder when everything is not fine. But if we're filled with the Spirit, we're still going to be pouring out of our soul thankfulness for what Christ has done. And you think about this. We give thanks for these, his blessings and the testings and trials, for his attributes, for his salvation. But think about this. How can we not speak out in thanks if you look at Ephesians chapter 1, that we've been blessed in him eternally with all the blessings that we have for all eternity. And then you go to Romans 8, 28 through 39 and all of this. And what can separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus? Not anything can do that. We are more than conquerors through him that loved us. And we know that that plan of salvation in Romans 8, 28 through 30, he's going to do it. It's going to be fulfilled. How can we not be thankful and pour out our voices in joy and praise and thankfulness? How not? We give thanks in all situations of life because my situation in life does not change the eternal reality of what I have in Christ. <laughs> Not for one millisecond. Not for one millisecond. And then he says, in the name, he says here, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father. Why in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ? I'll tell you why. Because he is the ground, the foundation of, and the source of all of our blessings, is he not? What do we have apart from him? Again, I'm going to turn back here to Ephesians chapter 1. And there in verse 3, this is all you need to find out that he's the ground. Because be, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessings in the heavenly places in Christ. Not when we get to the sweet by and by, but he has blessed us right now. Right now. It's yours. And it's mine for certain. Hallelujah, what a Savior. I just had to say that. Because we have that. How can we not? How can we not? Now, I know, you know, and I've had to confess my sin in this sometimes about complaining and not thanking God for everything he's given me. But this, this doctrine of what we have in Christ, it, it should humble us and make us thankful very quickly when we read that. You know, and let me say, if you can read Ephesians 1, 3 through 14 and look about everything that you have in Christ and your security in Christ and that you are sealed unto the Father by the Holy Spirit and you're certain for heaven and then you read Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10 and we, He has quickened us, He's made us alive and we were dead and we were in trespasses we walk in accord, according to the course of this world but God who is rich in mercy in the great love that He loved us and for by grace are you saved through faith how can we not rejoice in that? And if you can't rejoice in that, let me just say this in love. You've got a serious spiritual problem. If you can't rejoice in that, it's like somebody, it's even, I mean, if somebody gave you a million dollars, just walked in the door and gave you a million dollars, you'd probably be jumping up and down, hollering and screaming. We got a lot more than that, folks. We got a lot more than that. Can't be measured in dollars and cents. But as Paul is admonishing us to always give thanks here because there is, there's never a time when we are out from under the eternal blessings of God which we have in our Lord Jesus Christ.
And then he says, and being subject to one another in the fear of Christ here. In the fear of Christ. And so the word used here for being subject is hupotasso, and it has the meaning of being under obedience, in subjection, and submit oneself to. And it's used in different contexts. It doesn't mean absolutely just one thing. Uh, Romans 13 and 1 talks about being subject to the higher powers or authorities. We recognize that there, and he's talking about here about civil authorities. As believers, we're to be subject to those. We're not to be in rebellion. We're not to be out in the streets throwing Molotov cocktails and pounding police cars and destroying other people's property. We are to be submissive to those authorities as Christians. That's part of our Christian testimony. If you're speeding when you go home from church and the highway patrolman, and let me tell you, he's out here many days, and he pulls you over, you better be subject to him. You suffer the consequences if you're not. But there's other ways in which he's put. Hebrews 2 and 8, you have put all things in subjection under his feet, speaking of Christ. And let me tell you something, that's an absolute authority. That's not a cooperate. You're not cooperating with somebody. No, you are under his authority, absolutely. Then, of course, the next verse we're going to start next week, the one the wives and the husbands want to hear about. Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. And we'll talk about that next week. But there's a subjection there. There's an obedience there. It it means what it says. Paul, again, he was a Pharisee. He knew the Hebrew and the Greek very well. He didn't put that in there by accident. And we're not to edit it out in the 21st century, just let me say that. But this is not a calling really here for me to put somebody else in subjection to me. But what he's talking about here is each believer subjecting himself voluntarily and freely to one another. As he talks about over there in Ephesians, I mean, excuse me, in Philippians chapter 2, about let every man make himself see each other as better than themselves over there. You go over there to Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 11. We are to see everyone else in the church as a believer as better than us. We are to strive to be the doormat. Well, that doesn't sound very appealing. Well, Jesus said, he, he who basically puts himself first shall be last, and the last shall be first. But we are to do, it's a mutual thing in the church because being filled with the Spirit, we understand we are the sons of God. By grace, we are under His authority. And then this phrase here, the word here for fear is phobos, which means to be afraid or can mean exceeding fear. And I think, again, interpretation has to do with context. (laughs) Acts chapter 5, verse 5. You know what story that is? Ananias and Sapphira. That's more of an infamous story. And of course, you know they lied about what they were given to the church. And Peter said, Ananias, you've lied not to us, just to us, but you've lied to God, the Holy Spirit. And he dropped dead. And it said, great fear came on the church. (laughs) That was terror. (laughs) Those people knew then that God meant business about this Christian walk in this world. In Matthew 14 and 26, the apostles were in the a boat on the Sea of Galilee and they saw something coming across the water, walking across the water. It was Jesus. But they were all hollering, oh, it's a ghost. <laughs> That's what they were saying. It's spirit. They were all afraid. That was a terror of that. But then there's another way of fear is described. In 2 Corinthians 7 and 1, Paul talks about perfecting holiness in the fear of God. That is a reverential fear or awe of God. 
We don't have a fear of the final judgment of God because there is therefore now no condemnation for us. We stand in Christ, but we do still have a reverential awe and fear of God. And many people have lost that. They've lost that. Nobody thinks God, a lot of people think God's just a big grandpa in a rocking chair. He's not. I'm a grandpa in a rocking, well, I don't have a rocking chair, but anyway, you understand He's an authority. He is going to judge. And then in Philippians 2 and 12, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. That is a reverential fear, a reverential awe. So the difference here is that those who belong to Christ have a fear. It is a reverential fear, like a father that, you know, I loved my father, but I also feared him because I got some whoopings. (laughs) I feared the belt and I feared him in a reverential way. I knew he loved me. In the same way, we as the children of God understand that, in that. But for those outside of Christ, they have a fear that is a terror of Christ. They're going to call for the rocks and the hills to fall upon it. Cover us up! Hide us from him! But they're not going to be able to hide under the rocks either. That's that kind of fear. But thank God, as we see here, that this fear is a fear of Him who loves us and has saved us. And it produces humility and it produces a willful subjection to one another. And this is, this is what we are to be as believers. To be mutually humble to one another and to have that servant mentality with one another in the church. And if you have that in a church, you're not going to have a church split You're not going to have church fights because everybody is seeking to love one another to the utmost. And that's what we're described to do. But this is an evidence of the filling of the Spirit. The singing of the songs with joy, giving thanks all the time, and serving our Lord and one another in the fear of Christ. And I hope and I pray that you will do that if you're not already doing that and being subject to that. In God's Word. May we pray. Heavenly Father, we thank You so much for the grace and the goodness that You have shown us in calling us to be Your children. And Lord, may we be submissive to Your Word. As we've said so many times, these these instructions of Paul are not suggestions, they're commandments. They're really commandments from You. And so Lord, help us to be in obedience. May we be filled with the Spirit. May when we come to your house, we be singing with joy and gusto and praise. May in our day-to-day lives, Lord, may we be exceedingly, abundantly thankful no matter what state that we're in. And in serving you in God's house, may we truly be humble before one another in the fear of Christ. In your holy name we pray. Amen.